So now we're going to move into our first session this afternoon where we are going to focus on um, strategic partnerships, rare diseases with an emphasis on pediatric cancer research. And I would like to introduce our keynote today, um, Sarah Bartos. Um, who is joining us, and uh, Sarah was introduced to us by the American Cancer Society, and we're thrilled for their support as well and for this introduction to, to Sarah. Um, Sarah is the president of Gold in September, G9, and for many of you, you know that uh, September is Pediatric Cancer Awareness Month. You may hear often hear Go Gold in September, and Sarah is the a pediatric cancer research advocate, as well as a mother of three, and she is the president. G9 is dedicated to growing awareness, inspiring action, and funding research for childhood cancer. Pediatric cancer remains the leading cause of death by disease of children in the U.S., and despite the need for progress, childhood cancer awareness and financial support have not reached the same national level as other cancer awareness campaigns. Gold, G, is the recognized color for childhood cancer, and September 9 is designated as the National Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Together, they make G9. G9 directly benefits the entire childhood cancer community with Gold Alliance, and through global partnerships, strategic partnerships, an innovative approach is taken to spreading the word about pediatric cancer research, and G9 is growing the seeds of hope to go, to go gold. So without further ado, I'd like for Sarah to join me on the stage and she'll share her story. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think this is on. Yes, thank you, Sherry. Um, and thank all of you for the warm welcome um, and being here. I have really questioned why I am asked to be here. I haven't invented anything, I'm not an MD, I'm not a PhD. Should I show you charts and graphs, statistics and percentages? No. I have been asked to speak to all of you because there are people and personal stories behind those charts and graphs, statistics and percentages. I am one of those people. My family are part of those statistics and percentages. The rare disease of cancer has affected my family more than I could have ever, ever imagined. You are all industry experts in your chosen fields. I too am an expert, though I can't necessarily say that this field was specifically chosen. Though this was filmed five years ago, I'm gonna show a short introductory video um, and let my daughter Annie um, give you an introduction about G9 and why I'm here and why we should all try to grow gold and grow hope for kids. With that. Jack would be by my side forever. I believed kids were invincible. I believed all my dreams would come true. And I still believed in hope after Jack was diagnosed with cancer when we were just four. But when my brother died after fighting so hard for almost seven years, I wasn't sure what to believe in anymore. I've seen things turn pink in October and people rally for a cure. So I asked my mom and dad what the color and month for childhood cancer was. When they told me it was gold in September, I wondered why only the families who felt heartache like ours knew. They didn't have an answer. But I believe there is an answer, and I believe we all need to be a part of it. That's why I created the Gold in September Childhood Cancer Project I call G9. This project supports every child everywhere and will unite all foundations, organizations, hospitals, and people like me wanting to make a difference. Can you believe childhood cancer is the number one disease killer in kids and the rates are increasing every year? I can believe it because I've lived it. And now I'm going to do something about it. Will you help me? 
I believe in my dream of finding a cure. I believe we can help kids feel invincible again. I believe my brother would be proud of me and though he may not be by my side, he will be in my heart forever. I believe in gold. Um, Annie had hoped to join me, but she wants me to point out that she's now uh, going to be 18 in less than two months. She's had braces, and she's about to be a senior in high school, so she's somewhat mortified that I've shown you all of this video. Uh, your child has cancer. Four words that change live in an, lives in an instant and instantaneously change the way life is lived each and every day moving forward. I couldn't imagine putting my skills to use as a recent college grad in public relations and journalism working for the American Cancer Society. I was confident about my chosen path and the purpose in the world of philanthropy. Having watched both my mother and aunt battle breast cancer, I felt that I had a great story and I could passionately and purposefully tell the story about why cancer needs support. It was with keen interest and enthusiasm that as my career evolved, so did my desire to work specifically in the area of cancer research. And let me tell you, no one was more surprised than the journalism major that reading research proposals and understanding them and being able to, in layman's terms, um, explain them to people was something that I not only understood but also enjoyed. The reality is that it was an easy topic to discuss. One in two women, one in three men, this is a statistic that we all know. But what about kids? What's the statistic? How many children? How many young lives lost? How many lives impacted and changed forever? I was particularly humbled by donors who wanted to remember their young daughter who had passed away by helping to fund a researcher who was working on a project on Wilms tumor. They didn't want other families to feel the devastation that they felt missing their child. As the mother of the most perfect three-and-a-half-year-old twins, Jack and Annie, I couldn't imagine the grief those parents felt, missing their child for 30-plus years since she had passed and yet still wanting to make a difference for other families. Their perseverance in the face of such devastation left me shaking my head thinking, I could never survive such a loss. My work with these particular donors was going to culminate on September 23, 2005, where a group of people had gathered, there was a giant special event, I had the researcher flying in to introduce them to the family and all of the supporters making this work possible. I didn't make it to that event because I, after a week of flu-like symptoms, I was standing in an ER with my most perfect, not even four-year-old child, being told that he had stage four metastatic cancer called neuroblastoma. That is a true story. I was supposed to be at an event for pediatric cancer, and I was in the ER. Um, just like that, my family became part of a statistic, a statistic I thought that I was working to change, a, thought, a statistic I thought that I would never, ever be part of. And thus began my family's journey into the true depths of childhood cancer and the research needed. My feel-good philanthropic career goals quickly became personal, frightening goals about the life of my own child. Confident in our ability to beat the odds with knowledge and know-how, resources, we set out to make a difference and we traveled the country with Jack. My husband John and I took him from Wisconsin to New York to Texas and points on all points in between, looking for the best treatments, the best physicians, the best hope, and the best possibility. We met children and families from around the world in the playroom of Memorial Sloan Kettering. They were enduring the same journey that we were, and we shared laughter and tears, joy and sadness. As parents, we quickly bonded and we banded together to share information, resources, and most importantly, support. We also worked together to fund a new clinical trial. To kick off the efforts, a group of dads decided to ride their bikes across America. They called themselves the loneliest road. 
Think about that for a minute. Parents with children actively battling cancer, feeling the need to ride their bikes across America to raise awareness and funds. It leaves me shaking my head, but at the same time, I know that I would do whatever it takes. I didn't ride my bike, but we as parents will do whatever it takes to help our children. But when our children are in the hospital, or worse yet, at home, we shouldn't send parents out to have to feel the need to do this by themselves. I don't think this is the best that we can do. I think philanthropy needs to innovate, which is part of the reason why I am here. Our efforts to host and support fundraising efforts to fund new treatments bought Jack time, bought our family time. In fact, it gave us precious years. When Jack passed the five-year survival mark, he was considered a survivor. But we were still actively on frontline duty, worrying about options that were coming and how we could keep kicking the can down the road to another option, another treatment, another therapy, eventually a cure. It was a lonely road. More than 80% of children diagnosed with cancer survive five years. Great statistic, right? No, not when they're diagnosed at four, or 10, or 16. Five years is not enough time. In reality, less than a handful of the major types of childhood cancer have a true positive survival rate. Childhood cancer is the leading cause of death by disease in the United States. In fact, it accounts for more deaths than all other diseases combined. As you all know, it is not one disease. There are more than a dozen types and hundreds of subtypes of childhood cancer. Jack died just before his 11th birthday, six years and 11 months of fighting pediatric cancer. My beloved Jack's death on August 27, 2012, not only took years from his life, it took years of hope and happiness from all of us who loved him. Having a clever mind, a positive attitude, and an extraordinarily happy disposition through all of it, Jack in his lifetime had already left a mark. I can only imagine the impacts 70 more years would have had, not only on our family and all who loved him, but on this world. All that beauty was taken away, and my heart, my heart will never be the same. And honestly, I don't want it to be the same because it fuels me. It fuels me to make a change. It fuels me to make it better. It fuels me to speak to all of you and say, we can do this together. I'm here because I want to help make a change. I want to work with all of you. Less than 4% of the NCI's budget goes to pediatric cancers and only four drugs have been approved specifically for kids. We all know that childhood cancers behave differently, just like children behave differently than adults. If we don't expect children to act like adults, we can't expect their cancers to do the same. Children are our most valuable natural resource. They are novel. They help us innovate, create, change, and transform our world into something better. We have to give them a chance to do that. As a parent, your child is your heart and your home. The depths and distance to which you will go to find a cure are endless. I understand why people feel the need to support local endeavors, local hospitals, and local projects, and I certainly don't discourage that. However, children battling cancer all over this world should all be viewed as local. They are our responsibility. They are our future. They are our hope for tomorrow. They are all local to those of us who love them. Regardless of where a child is from, each of the children battling cancer are our collective responsibility. Every child deserves the opportunity to travel, to seek treatments, and most importantly, the opportunity to go home. We have to change the use of the word local from using it to describe geography or tumor containment, is it local, metastatic, or even the classification or particular name of pediatric cancers, neuroblastoma, leukemia, osteosarcoma. We have to go beyond this local idea and think globally in all terms and in all perspectives in order to effectively eradicate and make greater change. And we know that change in one area can lead to changes in other areas in all rare diseases. 
Though I have questioned and agonized, wondering what I could have done differently to protect Jack, as all mothers do, childhood cancers cannot be prevented because the causes are unknown. I expect some of you in this room are working on it. If not, you should be, along with opportunities for early detection. I stand with you. And what is to come of the true survivors? Nearly all childhood cancer survivors will suffer long-term side effects from the de and debilitating and life-threatening side effects from the treatments that they have received. Don't believe me? Let me tell you about my husband, John. He was diagnosed with liposarcoma in his early 20s, firmly placing him in the AYA cancer category. Young and healthy, his life was saved due to harsh chemotherapy and, at the time, novel interoperative radiation therapy. The caveat was that there would be likely side effects down the road. He suffered the destructive aftermath of the devastating disease as a college student in active treatment, as a parent with our son Jack, and then as an adult for whom there were no standards of care because nobody knew what to do in this long-term survivor category. John passed away in March of 2016. His heart and his mind strong, his body devastated by radiation. It isn't cancer that took John's life. Rather, his death was the result of treatments he received for his own cancer diagnosis. He struggled with these side effects for more than 20 years until at age 47, those side effects led to his death. Death should not be the side effect of a cure. I will stand on that platform for the rest of my days. John and Jack are both considered survivors. Neither of them are here. This cause isn't taken up by good citizens. It is burdened on families fighting. As my daughter Annie said during an interview once, we can't win the war against cancer with only the people fighting. That's like trying to win a war with only the wounded. We need the healthy and the strong. We need us. The side effects of cancer are not limited to the patient. There's grief, anxiety, depression, anger, PTSD, the list goes on. Mental health is sacrificed by the patient, the family, the caregivers. I am a widow. That's a side effect of cancer. I'm a grieving mother with two grieving children. That is a side effect of cancer. John and Jack's cancers were completely unrelated, which means our family was quite literally struck by lightning twice. When people hear our story, they are in shock and in disbelief. How can so much tragedy happen to one family? I ask myself that question every day. And people wonder, how do you do what you do? How do you get up and talk about this? If not me, then who? If not us? then who to talk about this and create the effective change that we need? I was six and a half months pregnant when Jack passed away. Our long-awaited third child, Tommy, was on the way. Um, and there are so many things I wish I could change about this picture of what happened to our family. But the one thing I wish I had was a picture of all three of my kids. I don't have it. Tommy only knows his brother Jack from pictures and now his father from pictures and the stories and pictures that I paint with my heart for his heart. What gives me great hope is to look out at this room and know that by coming together we will make a difference. You heard about G9, G for gold, nine for the ninth month of September. I didn't pick gold, I didn't pick September, but I surely choose to fight, and I surely choose to hold up this flag and hold up this banner for other parents, not just parents of childhood cancer patients, but parents with rare diseases who are in this battle with their parents, because the reality is that as parents, we are with our children. You have to treat all of us. We're a family unit. Everything that I know about childhood cancer in 2005, when Jack was diagnosed, cannot compare to what I know now, older, wiser, and changed by this disease. Last year, I read an article about a woman who passed away at the age of 92. It's a personal goal, I'll take it, where do I sign up for that number, and would that we all had that opportunity to live so long. I will never forget the article because it resonated so deeply with me. 
She spoke openly for decades about not being afraid to die because she had already faced something more painful than her own death, the death of her three-year-old child. It was 1953, and a young mom took her daughter to the doctor. The complaint was fatigue, the diagnosis was leukemia, the prescription was to go home, love her, and let her die. And while the family did not go home, and rather fought and traveled to seek treatment, their daughter did pass away seven months later, leaving a weight of grief and fresh tears she would carry for the rest of the 65 years that she stayed on this earth. That mom was Barbara Bush. This has nothing to do with politics. This is just the story of another mom. Because I am that mom. I had seven years instead of seven months. But in August of 2012, I was told it was time to go home. In fact, exactly seven years ago today, the only medicine that I was able to give my son was my love. I wish there would have been more that I could have done. We've come a wonderfully long way since 1953 or even 2012, but we haven't come far enough. In fact, as I was compiling my notes for today, I received a text from another parent seeking my advice for their multiple relapsed child. With three hospitals and doctors weighing in, she came to me asking for my insights, my thoughts, my recommendations for her own sweet boy. I was a human chatbot. Think about that. I am not meant to be a chatbot, I am a mom. But parents come together, and the reality of that statement that I just made should have us all shaking our heads. All this mom wants to do is avoid being told that she has to go home and give her son nothing more than love and wait for him to die. And while there are great tech advancements, do not underestimate the power of human connection and how we can make this great change together. I wouldn't be here if I didn't think that we had an opportunity to make a difference. I do believe that cures are possible. We are here because of innovation. But when I looked up synonyms for innovation, I was struck that one of the words was mutation, a word we use all the time when talking about cancer. Cancer has already innovated, which means we need to work harder, smarter, and collaboratively to get ahead. The moment a child is diagnosed with cancer or a rare disease, a mutation has already occurred and we are playing defense. I want to stand on offense. But there is hope. There is another Jack. When we were in the hospitals of Memorial Sloan Kettering, there was a family who had survived five years. Their son was doing well. His name was Jack. He was blonde. Our boys got along so well, they were there for their five-year scans. They were the goal we were all looking to, to replicate. If they can do it, so can we. Jack and Jack were friends. And on his five-year scans, they told him he relapsed. Five years, survivor. So again, he was put into the survivor category with a relapse. They were devastated. We spent many, many days and nights in the halls, chemotherapy, all of the beauty that comes with childhood cancer. But during this whole time, following the loneliest road, these families, my husband and I being among the first 10 families, had banded together. And we had tried to help raise funds for a new treatment, a new therapy. And we did band together. We raised more than a million dollars and fully funded that therapy. Our band of parents became hundreds of parents, and our total went up to millions of dollars. Our result was HU3F8, now known as Nexidimab, fully funded by parents in 2009, receiving FDA breakthrough therapy designation in 2018. Jack Demers received that therapy. My Jack was six weeks too late with another relapse. Right now, Jack Demers and his mom are packing because he's going off to college. He's going to be a freshman. He's not packing for a hospital stay. He's packing for fun. He's packing for his future. He doesn't have to think about hospitals and treatments. Jack Demers has a future. Jack's mom has a picture of all of her kids together, and we were part of creating that change for another Jack. Science is poised 
and technology unites us all in an instant. This is why we are here. But precision medicine requires precision funding, precision philanthropy, precision collaboration, precision strategy, and precision belief that we can create a global change. And there's been lots of talk about risk. But let me tell you, parents are not risk averse. The alternative is unacceptable. When you have a rare disease, we will go to whatever lengths. There are no risks too great. We are ready to do anything and everything. There is hope. There is help. We are all here in this room. But right now, there's not enough hope and help to go around. Another child, another mother, another family is experiencing the pain that my family has experienced and continues to experience. Children are being diagnosed at an ever-increasing rate. But today, everyone here in this room has an opportunity to grow that hope and increase that help. We can't do it alone. Together, our collective voices, resources, commitment, we can be the hope for children and the help that can follow. We as humans are novel. We don't need to create anything novel. We are our most novel creation. And our children, they're the most novel of all. Their light of hope and enthusiasm and knowledge burns bright. And it is our responsibility to make sure that it is not dimmed too soon. G9 isn't about my family. It isn't about one hospital or one clinical trial or one type of cancer or even pediatric cancer at all. It's about kids. It's about every child, everywhere, and how can we help them? Childhood cancer is considered a rare disease, though it is the leading cause of death by disease in children. So how can this be considered rare? We can call a disease rare, or we can do what is rarely done and create massive, sweeping, courageous change. I would like to make childhood cancer something that parents rarely have to think about because of novel therapies funded by novel philanthropy, fueled by novel medicine, novel technology, and all of us. That is why I am here. If I leave you with anything, I leave you with this. Diseases like childhood cancer may be rare, but the hope that exists within each and every patient and family fighting is never rare. If I can have hope, anyone can have hope. It's our collective job to innovate and collaborate so there is enough to go around, to ensure the road is not lonely and that kids can go home to survive and thrive. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored and humbled. Oh, thank you. What about this? So, Sarah, thank you so much. And why in the world I thought that I could be the moderator of this? I, that's, anyone who knows me knows that I'm not going to be the best person to do this. Um, what a wonderful person you are to share your story with us because oh, you. only through stories like this do do we have hope and are we motivated to do the things that otherwise I mean some may not even know that we need to do and I know right. that it's not easy and we really appreciate it oh, so thank you thank you thank you um, I have a couple of questions of course and then we're going to open it up for, to the audience as well um, you know, when we talked on the phone a couple of times, mm -hmm. one of the things that really struck me about our conversations is how you always mentioned, because I, I was talking in statistics and graphs like I typically do, and Sarah's like, stop it. Uh, no one wants to see your graphs, and no one wants to hear your statistics, Sharon. I did not say it that way. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I heard. Um, but instead, we have to make these stories personal. 
And um, so my question to you is, how do you believe that these personal stories are really changing and, and moving people to action? And how is your own story? What what if some of the results that you have seen from people taking action based upon sharing your own story? Well, I would first say that I think we need to humanize statistics. And I think that um, in some respects, either a patient survives and maybe they want to put childhood cancer behind them or a rare disease or any kind of medical event. Let's put that behind us. We've got to move on. And that's a, a big thing for me. No one's ever moving on. We move forward. We carry these lessons with us. We carry things with us as we move forward. Never on from what's happened. And I think that the stories, I, in fact, I think about the example that was just shared this morning about there are more pro-vax people out there, but those posts don't get shared. It's the anti-vax stories that are being shared because they're telling a story, not just a, a statistic. So to me, that's a prime answer to that question right there. We have to humanize this, and I think that um, whether it's sadness or you know, an event has turned out positive or negative, we have to be able to, to make people feel that this is not just about one family, but rather how can we tell a story that, every, that resonates with everyone? And I think our kids are our most valuable resource in being able to talk about that because we can all picture what this could or would be like. Um, certainly Bruce talked about that just before lunch as well with his own son. So I think it's the, it's the stories. How can we touch people's hearts? because I think it makes a difference in medicine, it makes a difference in philanthropy, and it will make a difference to get a more collective group around these topics rather than just the people who are fighting the disease. So now you know why um, I'm trying not to speak in statistics any longer. <laughs> I have to help, help tell the story. The other thing that really struck me about our conversations um, when you would talk about community. Mm. And often when we think about community, we think about our local community. Uh, you know, our tribe, our local tribe. And you said something that really struck with me about community, and I'd like for you to share that with the audience. Well, I, I hit on that just a little bit. I think it's this whole concept of local, that we think of our community as being local, or we think of our community in pediatric cancer that also becomes local, if you will, to neuroblastoma or leukemia or Ewing sarcoma. We've got to get beyond that sort of local geographic definition and talk about community as all of us, not just a community of people who have been affected. No one doctor, one hospital, one organization is gonna solve this problem. We have to work collaboratively. So when we think about community, of how we're gonna surround our children and our families, we think about that with education, nutrition, hunger, all of these topics, we have to think about that in the disease realm too and not just focus on one hospital or one disease so that as a community we can make a bigger global sweeping change. I would like to open it, so thank you for that. I would like to open it up to the audience. Are there any questions in the audience? I know that I cannot see you because I'm blinded by the light. Any questions out in the audience? Any comments from anyone out in the audience? Oh, God. Oh, is that James? Yeah. Hey, uh, James Wall from Stanford. Um, I'd like to just hear maybe a little bit more about the organization. Um, thank you so much for sharing the story. It is just, you know, mind-blowing, and, and thank you for all the work. But I'd like to hear about the organization and how it interacts with us as, you know, children's hospitals and physicians. So the organization started out literally with a group of parents when my son was diagnosed. So we kind of banded together. We were called the Band of Parents, which actually still exists at Memorial Sloan Kettering. We helped to fund um, H23F8 and then the neuroblastoma vaccine trial. What happened is that we as families all went home to our own communities, back to the community, the local part, but we all decided we could do what we could do best in our local communities to help raise funds so we could have this collective pool of money. So what happened is that there were lots of foundations that began to then sort of spin off, as you, if you will, and, and work either locally or on some more global efforts. We, our original effort was called I Back Jack. It's a great name. We all backed Jack. Um, but when Jack passed away, it was literally Annie when my husband and I sat her down and said that there were no treatments, there was nothing more that we could do. And through her tears at 10, she said, why don't people know about gold in September? 
if kids are novel, she had a novel idea. Why hadn't anyone thought about this? So what's happened with the organization is that we have tried to be very altruistic in our funding and in our funding models. We're certainly all donor-based, it's all philanthropic. Um, we're raising funds, but we started with a model of doing objective funding to centers of excellence hospitals, the best hospitals that could offer novel trials, really phase one trials for kids. So we did the projects with Memorial Sloan Kettering, we funded some other projects both within Wisconsin and down in Houston, and then we started funding the 27 centers of excellence through G9. And there were 27 hospitals that were able to qualify on objective measures. And those measures were helped to develop by uh, the Children's Oncology Group. And, and Dr. Peter Adamson has been an advisor to G9 since the beginning. Where we have shifted a little bit is doing things with Pediatric Match. And we, uh, G9 was the first private foundation to fund Pediatric Match. So that's now available at 93 hospitals because that's the collaboration of NCI and the COG to help deliver novel therapies to kids no matter where they might be and match them with clinical trials. That's really the direction of G9 is to be able to get, you know, move away from necessarily looking at our own specific grant applications to looking at where is good work taking place, how can we objectively fund that, and how can we collaborate with others to ensure that funding gets to where it needs to go and that more children and families can become aware of where those trials are taking place. So again, there's a lot of human, a lot of human bot isms in, in what we're doing here um, and a lot of hope that we have to be able to do some objective work or partner St. Baldrick's ACS who are going to um, come on stage here and talk about collaboration. I mean, those are wonderful partners. We all need to be working together. So that's really the goal. I hope that answered your question. Yes, but thank, be, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for asking. So we have time for one more question. And um, there was one, there was a final comment from you um, when during our discussions, and I asked you, what does collaboration mean to you? Mm -hmm. We're going to be talking about partnerships. I spy, we really see ourselves as the convener. We're leaving this to move into a panel discussion about collaboration. And so if you could share with the audience what collaboration means to you. Oh, collaboration means um, that no one hospital, organization, or group, or physician can do this alone. We have got to work together. Cancer has already innovated, so we need to work more effectively and more efficiently. I believe that through collaboration, we can get beyond politics and process should not impede progress. And that's my big hope, is that through collaboration, we can put politics and policies and process aside and really move to where progress can take place. Maybe we can move the needle a little faster, a little stronger, and with a whole lot more heart and hope. So collaboration is hope. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you.